As network automation becomes more important to our customers, it is necessary to understand the transition in the northbound APIs of the network elements. I'm Barbara Fox, and today I'm going to describe the transition from proprietary CLI to open APIs, how they work, and why they're important. In traditional network management architectures, operators have a business system where they ask the network management system to create a specific service. The NMS will break the request up and send subtasks to the element management systems. And each EMS controls particular types of network devices and will send individual requests to each device. The entire network management system is typically owned by one vendor and manages its equipment. The NMS has a deep understanding of the NEs and the communications between the entities is proprietary. Customers want to transition to a network management system that can man manage multiple vendors' equipment and manage them at multiple layers, at layer zero, layer one, layer two, layer three, all through one management system. In the modern architecture, the OSS BSS system talks to an orchestrator. The orchestrator can talk to many different vendors' equipment and it has an overall complete view of the network. So it'll talk to controllers, which may be the network element itself, or maybe a network management system for a particular element type. Current controllers mostly use proprietary CLI commands to configure different vendors' equipment. So say the operator wanted to create an E-line service between a Cisco and a RAD device. The controllers could configure each device using its own proprietary CLI. Now, it's really not hard to use proprietary CLI for configuration. Configuration is fairly straightforward, but it becomes more difficult when you're looking for operational information or telemetry information. That's when you start to use either SNMP or CLI screen scrape. So SNMP works fine. It's slow, but it's fine. But if you think of CLI screen scrapes, we use them for operational information, to retrieve operational information, but they're really just developers writing printf statements. So the developer is expecting that a human is going to read the information. So they're, they're really not that careful. So if there's an anomaly in the network, they might throw an extra line into a show command and say, oh, this thing is happening too, and it's probably really important. And that's fine if a human is reading it, but it would be difficult for a computer to parse because it's an anomaly and it's probably unknown syntax. So we're moving to a future with standard APIs. Customers don't want to spend a lot of money or do a lot of work to add a new device into the network. They want all devices that support the same service type to su support the same API. And they want to use a structured interface to tell each network element, I want you to create this service. Here's the minimum information that's required to create this service. So like if you were creating an E-line connection, it might be, I want this connection to start at this port, end at this port, and have this much bandwidth. So this is the interface that we're talking about. The interface between the, the it's the southbound interface of the controller and the northbound interface of the network element. So what do we want in open APIs? The first thing is abstraction. We want to normalize the data so that we can describe a service in a normalized way. It's described with the same minimal information that every vendor should be able to support. We want to support automation. We don't want a, a person to have to look at this information or read through information from the computer and parse it. We want a computer to be able to do it because the computers are faster and if they're programmed correctly, they make fewer mistakes. We want to be able to integrate. We want to be able to support complex services. So say we wanted to create an E-line e private service that ran over OTN, that ran over an optical channel. We might get a request for the Ethernet private line service, but the optical channel doesn't exist, the OTN tunnel doesn't exist. So the network management system would need to understand that and create those first. So, First, it would create the optical channel, and when that was complete, it would create the OTN tunnel, and then when that was create, 
uh, complete, it would create the Ethernet private line service. So the orchestrator has that logic built into it so that it can create complex services. And then the last thing is that there's translation. So the network elements really have all the information, all the operational data, all the telemetry data. It's just not necessarily in the format that the operators want the data. So the operators want to define a model that the network elements would use to share the data. NEs would translate all their information into a structured data and send it to the operator. So what are APIs? They're purpose-built. An API will be built for a particular service we may have. We might build an API to create an MPLS tunnel with a pseudo wire, or we might have a different API that creates a G8032 ring. So as we transition from older proprietary methods to new APIs, we might create some services using CLI, and then as the network elements to start to support the APIs for particular services, we would start to use the newer APIs. So again, it should be programmable. The computer should be able to do it. It should be vendor neutral. You shouldn't have to know a vendor's particular information and it should be extensible. If we have a model and we're minimizing the amount of information that's needed to create the service, why would any vendor do that? They wanna be able to say, look, my hardware is better than my competitors. So what they want to be able to do is extend the model to support features that they support in their network element. So a vendor might extend the model for a protocol feature that it supports that isn't in the minimal cell. So it's important that the, model can, that the models are extensible so that vendors can sell their features. And then it has to be scalable as with everything. So what is an API? There are really three parts to an API. There's the data model, which describes what the service looks like. There's the encoding, which is how you structure the information. You have to encode the data model into a language that both the network management system and the network element understand. And then there's a protocol, which is basically the rules governing how we exchange data between the NMS and the network element. So we'll start with the data model. Data models are defined by standards bodies or forums or consortiums, places where different vendors and different operators get together. So the Metro Ethernet Forum would create the model that defines what uh, Ethernet services look like in E-Line and E-LAN and E-Tree service. MEF will define the minimum requirements necessary to support the service, and it might add some optional fields. So MEF can define both optional and mandatory fields. And they're usually used for configuration, but operational data is also defined, information that you might be able to pull about the service. And so the standards body would create the model for its particular uh, services that it defines. So on this slide, you see a whole bunch of different forms and standards bodies. Most of them are traditional standards bodies run primarily by vendors and customers, with the vendors defining what's necessary for the protocols to set up a service. So OpenConfig is really an operator consortium. It was started by Google, at and is part of it, BT, Microsoft, and it's really the operators saying, okay, I understand that you're gonna create the network and you're gonna create the services and configured things, but I need the information that I need to be able to manage and run my network to see what the operational state of the network is. So they're concerned with what it takes to manage the network and they're asking their vendors to support open config Yang models in their equipment. So Yang is the modeling language. It's the way that you create the model, the way that you define the model and the way that we talk about the model. So in SNMP, the modeling language was an SNMP MIB. For CORBA, it was an IDL. Now it's Yang, yet another next generation language. The model describes what is important for this service or entity. It's not really a machine readable language, it's really a descriptor language. 
but now it's a de facto standard and that's great because there are a lot of tools that have been created to be able to convert Yang into XML or Yang into JSON or Yang into protobufs. Because it's the de facto standard and there are lots of tools, it's a lot easier to generate code that the computers can read. So Yang is defined in is defined by the IETF in RFC 6020, if you want to look at it. The third part, the last part of the API is the protocol. These protocols define how entities talk to each other, how they exchange data. So the first one we're going to talk about is NetConf. NetConf is really about configuring network entities, configuring services. It was created by the IETF to do that, and it's trying to address a lot of problems that we've had in the past. One of the first things the controller does in NetConf is have a conversation with the network element and say, what models do you support? What schemas do you support? And then the NMS uses those models to manage that device. NetConf is a pretty robust protocol. It's got a running database and a candidate database. So you can write configuration into the candidate database, and then the device can determine whether or not, in addition to being syntactically correct, it's semantically correct, if it's gonna work on this device. There's a rollback capability. So say you create a service that traverses four different devices. The configuration worked on one, it worked on two, but it failed on the third device. You'd have to roll back the second device and the first device as well as the third device. So you need to the, the ability to roll back to remove the configuration. When you're able to successfully configure that service across all four devices, it might be written to the candidate database and then you can commit it to the running database when you're sure that it works. So while NetConf is a robust protocol, you don't have to implement all of it in order to say that you're NetConf compliant. You can just have a running database. You don't actually have to support the candidate database. NetConf encodes the Yang data in XML. And the conversation between the NMS and the NE is XML over SSH. RESTConf is a subset of NetConf. RESTConf only supports a running database, not the candidate database. Data can be encoded in either XML or JSON, and it's forwarded over HTTP over TCP. In both RESTConf and NetConf, the data is human readable. XML and JSON are human readable, if you were to look at a network trace. So gRPC comes out of OpenConfig, and it's initiated by Google. It uses protocol buffers. Now, the thing about protocol buffers is they're not human readable. They take the Yang model and they compile it into binary format. So instead of having field names, there are numbers that indicate a particular field. And the reason they do that is because they want the transmission to be fast. So gRPC is used often for telemetry. The network management system subscribes to the NE and requests the operational and telemetry data that it wants. So gRPC is really replacing SNMP. SNMP is a pretty slow protocol. You have to do a get for everything, and then the information comes back as atomic information. So say the NMS sent an SNMP get for port statistics. And he would reply, here are the number of packets that we received on port one, on port zero. Here are the number of packets we received on port one. Here are the number of packets we received on port two. Here are the number of packets we transmitted on port zero. Here are the number of packets we transmitted on port two. Da, da, da. So it's a slow protocol and you have to make a request for every bit of data that you get back. So you might do get, get next in between all of those uh, all of that information being sent back from the NE. So with gRPC, there's structured data. It can be read by the computer. And after the NMS subscribes to the NE for a particular type of data, that data is forwarded up to the network management system unasked. So it can send chunks of data as structured data, and it sends it without being asked. gRPC also supports configuration. 
So Google thinks about configuration a little differently than our traditional service providers. Google is used to configuring thousands of network elements. So they think about configuration as configuration state and operation state. In the previous example, when we were going to talk about an Ethernet private line service that ran over an OTN tunnel that ran over an optical channel, there is state in that configuration. So if you asked to create the Ethernet line, you might get back operational state saying, oh, the channel was configured. And then you receive operational state, the OTN tunnel was configured. And then you might receive operational state, the Ethernet line is configured. So there's more operational information involved in configuration. It's not just a synchronous command where you say create this thing and you just sit there until it's done. For CD CDNs, it's intent-based. Do it and tell me when you're done. It's asynchronous, right? So I hope this has helped you think about how the network devices, northbound interfaces are changing from CLI to structured APIs and why it's important. So thanks for your attention and take care.